come on stage. All right, thank you, Laura. Um, so yes, my name is Mark Chun, and at the Hewlett Foundation, we have term limits. We have eight-year term limits on the program side. And so everybody knows exactly when they're going to finish up because they know when their, their, their termination date is. It's a lot easier for me because th this conference actually coincides with my term. So this is the fourth year of the conference. Next week, we'll celebrate my fourth anniversary at the foundation. So it's really easy to chart time with that. So uh, it, with that in mind, it, it's a reminder of like how much has happened in the past four years. I know I've grown and learned. I think this conference has grown and learned. And so we're trying to figure out how we pull this all together. So I just have a few comments I'd like to share. And at the foundation, we focus on deeper learning as well as open educational resources. And if you're not familiar with that, it's how we make resources available for free that folks can remix and reuse such that they can improve education. So I'm going to bring those together in my very brief comments today. So let's think about this as a graduation. Four years means like it's like I'm a graduating senior. This conference is a graduating senior. So I'm going to give a few um, graduating remarks to the conference. All right. So welcome graduates, family, friends, distinguished guests, and passionate deeper learning educators in the class of 2016. All right, from a found see this is how you do the OER. I'm telling you what to reuse. Okay, from a foundation's point of view, we take great pleasure in participating in activities supported by the charitable and the elemosynary investments we have the honor of providing. In the few minutes I have, I'd like to congratulate this conference for being about deeper learning, but also demonstrating elements of deeper learning along the six key deeper learning outcomes. So I'll just quickly go through six points that I feel reflect the tremendous accomplishments of the conference over the past four years with regard to content. Now, I can remember the first conference way back in 2013 when the team was still trying to figure out how to structure a conference about meaningful learning, but doing so by modeling meaningful learning. It wasn't until the second conference in 2014 when they came up with a brilliant idea of the day-long deep dives or participants' experiences culminate in making something, which they then exhibit for their peers. The content has continued to grow and expand, and in the past years, bringing in crucial issues of equity. Because ultimately, we need to make sure that those least advantaged by the system are the ones who have opportunities to develop deeper learning competencies, so they're ready to take on the challenges that they'll face in college, career, and civic life. So the reason we're that's the reason we're engaged in this work. I credit the organizers for being so wise and thoughtful in how they focused in on the conference um, content that really matters. Second, over the past four years, the conference has demonstrated critical thinking and problem solving. Now, how does a meeting that in 2013 had about 300 attendees go through a growth spurt, and in 2016 have demand increased threefold to have 900 attendees, and yet make yes, you can applaud there. Um, and yet make it still feel intimate. Like how can you grow big without losing a sense of being small? And I think the conference team was um, left between Scylla and Charybdis. Both, um, but with the creative use of this um, beautiful new space, which has like one bathroom, nevertheless, um, and programming that keeps participants in small groups, they've overcome these challenges. Now third, with regard to collaboration, over the past four years, the conference has found ways to make this conference a home for many other groups, such as the Deeper Learning Equity Fellows, supported by Big Picture Learning and the International Network for Public Schools, the Deeper Learning Leadership Forum, organized by Envision Learning Partners, the College, the College um, Career and Civic Readiness Network Improvement Community, organized by the High Tech High Graduate School of Education Center for Research on Equity and Innovation, supported by the Walton Foundation, <laughs> Student Voice, Startup Education, and Tali Lerner, who organized an international deeper learning educator community. So it's thrilling to see how in four short years, this meeting has become a hub for allied groups who all care about deeper learning. Now fourth, for communication, 
I recall that the first year, we at Hewlett had barely started to even use Twitter, and I shamelessly came on the, the, the variation of this stage, and I begged everyone to follow me on Twitter just so I could win an internal contest about who could get the most Twitter followers. Now, four years later, <laughs> I'll wait. Um, four years later, if it weren't for those, those uh, puppies, deeper learning could have been the most trending hashtag on Twitter. So that's like amazing that's happened. Um, I think the recent upgrades in the Sketch app, which is, is fantastic, and the little chalkboards that we carried around, like both in a high-tech and a low-tech way, we found new ways to communicate. And I credit the organizers for that. Now, fifth and sixth, um, there's learning to learn and maintaining a learning or academic mindset. What I, most impresses me about this conference is that the organizers are put together a truly special experience, but nevertheless don't rest on their successes. So instead, they try to learn each year about what could make us better, coming up with things that you won't find at any other conference, be that the deeper learning band, or paddle boarding at daybreak, a makerspace, the deep dive den, jumbo Jenga, or a foundation program officer trotted out to fill time. So, um, as I finish up, I'd like to my, express my appreciation to all the folks who made this possible. Um, Haley Marugason, Ben Daly, Laura McBain, Cheyenne Mansky, Carmen Ramirez, La Ortigueta, Randy Shear, my agent, um, and of course, all the students for not only making the not only making the conference run, yes. But that's the reason we're here. That's the reason that all this matters. So, um, congratulations, Deeper Learning Conference, for four years of hard work and learning, for facing unexpected challenges, and for graduating with honors. I can't wait to see what you do next. So, as you face the future, let me just impart some words of wisdom. Don't stop thinking about tomorrow. <laughs> Don't stop believing. And don't you forget about me. Thank you. And, and thanks, Ben, for the comic timing. I couldn't have done with them. All right, so now I'd like to bring up Lillian Sue, who's going to. Uh, Take us to the next part. She's the director of High Tech High Chula Vista. She, was in the first, she is in the first cohort of the Equity Fellows, and she's a graduate of the, graduates, the High Tech High Graduate School of Education. Lillian. It is a joy to introduce you. It is a joy to introduce to you this morning, Rob Reardon. Rob, together with Larry Rosenstock, founded this miraculous place that we find ourselves in today. His official title is Emperor of Rigor and President Emeritus of the Graduate School of Education, but truly to many of us, Rob will always be our North Star. Rob's voice reminds us that project-based learning is not an end in itself, but rather a vehicle for engaging students and teachers together in a shared sense of purpose. Through the years, he's inspired us to use students' lives as our text, to seek out authentic purposes and audience for their writing, and to reimagine our classrooms as think tanks rather than individual silos of information. Through it all, Rob has embodied a model of leadership that many of us aspire to, a leader who is fully present in every interaction, who listens deeply, who honors and builds on the strength of teachers while helping them to imagine new possibilities for growth. Most of all, he's demonstrated a model of leadership that is unafraid to show emotion because it's okay to care deeply about the work that we do. Most of all, I am heartened and inspired by Rob's reminder that this work is never done. He writes, even the original High Tech High has not yet reached the achieved state and probably never will. High Tech High is not a model, but rather a laboratory. Not a franchise, but rather a set of principles and a growing body of applied experience. Please welcome me, please join me in welcoming to the stage the wizard behind this laboratory, Rob Reardon.
Thank you. I'm glad you're standing now because you won't be standing another 45 minutes or so. Um, this uh, this uh, little keynote here is, um, you, you must know already, many of you know already, this is co-constructed. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I take full responsibility for anything that may come out of my mouth. Uh, as a, just a little spoiler alert, um, first of all, where's Jesse Brown? There he is. So what it, what it is about coming together is that we come together to break bread, um, as well as to share ideas and all that stuff. We're breaking bread here, and Jesse is the man who brought the bread. So um, let's hear it for Jesse. So just a bit of a spoiler alert here. This will uh, not be a deep dive. Uh, it will be a shallow dive. We've been diving deeply, you know, for these days, so I think it's time for to come up for a little air, okay? So we're going to be kind of shallow here. I'll do my best to be shallow. Uh, and I need to tell you also that, uh, I mean, Lillian has already alluded to this. Lillian just gave my talk. I mean, so I mean, but anyway, Lillian has alluded to this. Uh, I tend to get emotional sometimes when I'm speaking. Uh, and it's going to happen. It happened already. It happened before I came up here. But you just need to know that it happens all the time with me, and it's normal. So don't be alarmed when it happens, OK? Uh, Lillian and others say, you know, when they begin to get a little emotional in front of people, they just say, I'm channeling Rob. So what you're going to experience now is Rob channeling Rob. Okay. I want to start with an equity moment and uh, a couple of equity moments. One of them uh, start is at uh, Miles College. I was teaching at Miles College, a historically black college in Birmingham, Alabama in 1967-68. And the other, I mean, the connections that we've been making here these last few days are amazing. But I was talking with a group from St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, the other day. And one of the women had a, a T-shirt on that said, Bethune-Cookman College. And I said, whoa, has any of you ever heard of Miles College? And so one of the women in the group said, yeah, that's where I went. So I said, whoa, I taught at Miles College. So then we got to talking about Miles College in Birmingham, Alabama. And, and the guy who was the dean of Miles when I was teaching there became the first black mayor of Birmingham, Alabama, and so on. So we had a lot to talk about. And then her name is Stacy, and she said she was going to come to hear my keynote, and she'd be sitting in the front row. Um, and I said, whoa, I really need you to be in that front row. And then she came to me later, and she said, I just learned that we're flying out early Friday morning, and I'm not going to be able to be there. So, but, she said, I think they're streaming this. I'm going to be in the airport, and I'm going to be watching. So, Stacy, this is for you, okay? And it's for all, all of you out here. But my equity moment. I, so I was at Miles, and I was there to, to be a, a, a teaching fellow in the freshman studies program. A dean from Harvard had left Harvard, decided to leave Harvard to go to Miles College and be the director or the dean of freshman studies. And I at that time was an MAT program of graduate at the Graduate School of Education at Harvard and I was about to be assigned. I had been assigned that I had just been in the Peace Corps in Morocco for a couple of years teaching English as a foreign language, and phys ed and, phys ed and French um, in a little village uh, north of Fez and on the edge of the Earth Mountains. And I, to me, it wasn't so appealing to think about going to teach in a suburban junior high school uh, for my internship in the MAT. And in the newspaper, said this guy, in the New York Times, said this guy is going to Miles College. I went over to his office and said, I hear you're going down to Birmingham. Uh, and he said, yes, I am. I said, I want to go with you. And we talked for a little while, and then he said, well, if it's okay with them, it's okay with me. And then I went over to the office, and they said, if it's okay with him, it's okay with us. So I went to Miles. 
So I was there. The first thing we did in the freshman studies program was read the autobiography of Malcolm X, which was a, a transformational uh, encounter for me. Um, but at the same time, I had this idea that I would, um, I thought it would be great to do a film series because, you know, that's what I'm, at, at college, we had a film series. It was really fabulous. So I, organized, I, I got approval and I organized a film series. And some of the films I thought were pretty good, uh, but it was this thing where you get this 16 millimeter projector, you have to wind the film up and everything. So, I mean, I showed the mouse that roared, which I thought was pretty funny and everything with Peter Sellers. And so I'm putting up the, the flyer on the cafeteria window for the next film. And I hear over, uh, you know, over here, Ronald Jackson is the president of the student body and a radical student activist talking to a friend of his and he says, there goes Whitey with his picture show. And uh, that was an equity moment for me because for all the stuff that I was so uh, feeling so good about, that here I was at Miles College and learn and doing Malcolm X with students and all of that, he positioned me uh, in a way that hurt, uh, but that in the end was a great gift to me. Uh, I've, I've never forgotten that moment, uh, and I've never forgotten that, to think about my positionality. So in case you haven't noticed, I'm white, okay? That's, I mean, that's where, we, that's where we go from. But then there's another equity moment. There's Jen Husbands over here. Uh, when we were doing the, uh, the Graduate School of Education, uh, she and I decided we were going to collaborate to teach the course in equity, diversity, and design principles. And we did. And we had a wonderful experience. It was a wonderful course. The next year, she was moving to do, uh, to work more intensively on the credentialing program, I believe. And she, she said to me, I can't do that course this year. You're going to have to do it. I said, Jen, what do you mean? I mean, I'm a, I'm a white person. I'm, you're gonna, I'm, I'm going to teach this course. And she said to me, you know what? We need to have white people standing up to address equity issues and to teach courses like this. So I said, okay, that's another equity moment for me. And thank you, Jen. Uh, and it's another instance of positioning. We did, um, so you had all your equity moments, and you had, uh, I mean, you were thinking about them, and you did the Paseo exercise. I was really struck by a comment that uh, Lindsay Hill made, and I was asking around about it. It seems to be more general. We did the Paseo exercise, and anyone in those exercises who was a person of color and they did those identity, identity grids, race or ethnicity was right at the center. White people in the room, it wasn't even on the chart. I think that's something that we need to interrogate. Um, I mean, it's okay, but it's something moving forward we need to interrogate uh, in terms of thinking about who we are. Uh, because as we're engaged in equity work, uh, we need to be aware uh, of that we are also uh, a piece of that work and that our whiteness enters into that uh, work and it is part of our identity um, even though we may think like many tribal groups and so forth that we're humans and anybody else is a race or ethnicity. That's not the way it works. Um, Ronald Jackson taught me that, Jen Husbands has taught me that, and it's something that we need to continue to, in to interrogate as we go along. It's a question that goes away, but then it comes back. It's always there, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the grounds for continuing interrogation as we move forward. Somewhere I'm supposed to... What, what's, oh, okay. Let's see if this can work. Oh, I, I went backwards. Oh, why don't we just look at that one for a while? <laughs> okay, so here's some of the questions that uh, I've heard 
uh, over these past couple of days. So how do we engage in deeper learning, you know, when there's so many obstacles? I mean, there's the standardized test, there's the fragment day, there's resistance to change, there's all the things that David T.C. Ellis was talking about. How do we engage when at so many levels there are so many obstacles? More about that later. Uh, Juliet Montron was asking me the other night at the reception, with everything that's going on and with us being public schools, how do we navigate the political winds? How do we talk about equity and engage in equity without being perceived as political in the public arena? But Lindsay Hill, in the Deep Den dive, Deep Den talk, had a very interesting comment about that. That one way that we can engage in this is to not to uh, profess, not to indoctrinate, but to interrogate reality. Data um, that there, and she shared with us some data around birth weights of Af African American uh, birth rates, birth weights um, that are low, and, and there's a whole raft of statistics that you can look at to show that those birth weights are lower um, for African-American families and that there has to be a reason for that um, that's tied up in the way our society conducts itself and the economic stuff and so forth. But I'm thinking also about one of our teachers, uh, Brian Meyer from a couple of years ago. He saw an equity issue in his school in North County and he thought, well, man, I'm going to take this to my advising group. It, was, it had to do with the fact that there were inequities in the school in terms of who had access to what. And it's this whole story about, you know, if, you, if you're going to do a trip and everybody's raising money for the trip uh, and everybody has to go raise money, and you're selling tickets or something like, like that, the, the privileged kids, their parents buy all the tickets. And, and the, the, the kids who have fewer resources are out going door to door or they're selling tacos somewhere. So that's an equity issue. And Brian wanted to bring that. But he decided, no, I'm not going to go to my advising group. I'm going to go to my math class. So what he did is that they were doing uh, scatter plots and correlation. And he asked his students to go online and get the mean family income and the mean standardized test scores of communities surrounding San Marcos, where, where North, High Tech High North County is. So the kids went out and got that data, and they brought it back, and they put it all together on a scatter plot. And lo and behold, they saw a correlation between mean family income and mean standardized test scores. And it was something they had never thought about before. It opened up a, a whole new view of reality around it. And Brian wrote an article about it in Unboxed. And at the end of the article, he says, I could have asked them to correlate height and shoe size. But instead, I did this. Um, interrogating reality. Um, and it made a huge difference. And so when he was talking with his kids in an assessment conversation about how we did with this, it wasn't just about the math and about the correlation. It was about the, the, the new perspective that they had and what they had achieved in this was to see mathematics as a powerful lens for understanding the world. Uh, so it was much more than simple correlation. It was understanding math as a lens. If we get to this later, I want, I want to, as I talk about experience as text, I think we need to move to, if we're doing a paradigm shift, Alfred North Whitehead says, you know, the ancients used to educate for dispositions. In the 20th century, and now the 21st, he wrote this in 1920. In the 20th century, sadly, we have been reduced to teaching subjects. We need to escape the subjects and see our disciplines instead as lenses for understanding the world. I'm getting off track here, but that's OK. Where are we on the questions? Oh, yeah. How can white educators be white and still reach black students and black males? How can we, and Lillian's question, 
Thank you, Lillian. How can we take what we've experienced here and not just feel good about it, but go back to our settings and make meaningful and radical change? And finally, a question that is everywhere, what can I do? What can I do? So this is not a Q&A, and I don't have the answers. Uh, but nevertheless, I hope that these remarks will touch upon uh, these questions as we move on. This conference has been about sharing stories, and so I want to share mine a little bit. Uh, I've told you about Miles College a little bit. I went into Miles College, learned a whole lot, transformative experiences, and so on. Came back to Cambridge um, and um, entered the Graduate School of Education. There's a longer story about that. But in any case, I was in, partly because of my experiences in Morocco and then in Birmingham, uh, I became active in uh, civil rights and anti war stuff in Cambridge and was, you know, part of the occupation of University Hall at Harvard and was one of several uh, education students that were busted and so on. And then people, and then I went around, I was radicalized, I went around and started grabbing the mic at meetings and stuff. And then I got this call from a friend of mine who said, we would like you to be on the Harvard Educational Review. And I said to him, you don't want me on the Harvard Education Review. And he said, no, no, yes we do, yes we do. Um, and so I went on it. The first thing that happened was that we were doing a special issue on illiteracy in America. And it so happened that Paulo Freire was in Cambridge for a year at the Center for Development and Social Change. And we convinced Paulo Freire to submit an article to our special issue on illiteracy in America. And he submitted, an, it was the first article he published in English. It was called The Adult Literacy Process as Cultural Action for Freedom. Um, and I had the great fortune to be assigned to be the article editor on that. And I worked with him and with a close colleague, a colleague of his, uh, João da Vega Coutinho is his name. He was a, uh, a Portuguese Jesuit from Goa uh, and a close associate of, uh, of Paulo. And we went over, it was a poor translation from the Portuguese. We went over it word by word by word by word. Um, and it was burned into my mind and I took it into the work that I engaged in as I moved into a school within a school. Now, TC, you went to the St. Paul Open School, and now while you were at the St. Paul Open School, I was at another hippie school in Cambridge, uh, working with a group of people who were putting the school together. Um, and it was a school, it was a public school within a school, but the kids hired the faculty. Um, and we used, we were into this business of experiences tech, and some of the kids put on a review which was called Nothing, uh, Nothing is Something. Nothing is Something. And this was 1972, 1973, something like that. Looking back on it, I think that was my, probably my first experience of hip hop culture. Um, it's like creating something out of nothing. And that's what they were doing in this, in this show. I didn't know it at the time. I didn't appreciate it at the time. I didn't know what, was, what, it, what it meant at the time. Um, but there we were, um, attempting. And what I had in mind was Paulo Freire the whole time in that school. Fast forward many years, and the opportunity to start High Tech High um, Freire stays with me. And I think um, when you look at what's going on at High Tech High, you see Paulo Freire. You see cultural circles. You see students attempting to unpack their reality. You see the effort to 
level out the relationship between teachers and students. Brary didn't even want to use the word teacher or use the word student. And he had to do gymnastics. He called educator and educatee, which was even more cumbersome in a way. But he just didn't want to, did not want to have this hierarchical kind of thing. Um, and it was very important to Ferry, the role of the educator in helping the learner to understand the truth of their own reality was to select from that reality mediating objects to look at. And that the, that the learners and the teacher, the facilitator, would look at together. Now, we just saw a mediating object here. It was the video. It was the Skywalk video. There's a mediating object drawn from the reality. And what do we make of it? And what sense do we make of it? And if we are going back to Prairie, if we are unpacking these mediating objects, we begin to understand that, well, back up for a second, Eleanor. Eleanor was telling us the other day, Piaget, from Piaget, and what she learned from Piaget, that words are very ineffective and almost useless in, in transmitting content to someone else. And there have to be other ways to do it, ways of doing. And we saw Carly here dancing her expression. It's not words. It was not words. And yet she communicated to us. In fact, I can't do what Carly did, but I can do a jazz leap. And I'm going to do one right now. But words don't do it. Words don't do it. But Prairie understood and showed us, and you were a Prairie, and also that words can speak for us. Words can unpack reality. It's not about transmitting something to someone else, but words can engage us in dialogue with reality and in dialogue with each other. They can speak for us. Carly. I am human. Lewis, black lives matter. All lives matter, but black lives matter. Words speak for us. When I was back in that pilot school, one of the things that we, I was introduced by an educator whom I revere, named Diane Tabor to an exper a program called Experiments and Experiences in Writing. We had a diverse group. We had kids uh, from the projects, black and white kids from the projects. We had middle class kids. We had kids who would not speak to each other on the street. And our issue was, how do we bring those kids together in the same classroom for a writing experience that they can all, ha all have access to and that will not only engage their writings, but also build a sense of community. So there's there this wonderful, uh, and I thought, I, I ended up teaching that course for 10 years. Um, and it was, the, the structure of the course was students would write for one day, in one, on one day, 15 minutes, and then we'd pass them in, and this was the, in the days before computers. It was the day of the ditto machine. I would type them up. And then the next morning, run them off on the ditto machine and bring them in, and that was the text. We all read our pieces that we had read the day before, that we had written the day before. And I began to realize that this was not just a writing. And, and so it would be a writing day and a reading day. Very simple structure. And kids know, they've come in, what's today, a writing day? Oh, yeah, well, I know what's happening. So writing one day, reading those writings the next day. 
I came to realize oh, what, and this was not just a writing course, it was a reading course. Because halfway through the course, I could bring in uh, the writings, had all, every name, the names were attached to the writing. I could bring in the writings without the names. I'd say, okay, so, and we would read someone else, we'd just read them at random. Somebody read a piece, and we, I'd say to the group, so, okay, so who wrote that one? And the group knew who wrote every piece. How'd you know that, that uh, Shelley wrote that one? Well, she always writes about motorcycles, you know? How'd you know that Johnny wrote that one? Well, you know, a lot of big, big words in that one. Length and so forth. Diction, content, um, uh, length of sentences, in other words, style, sentence variety, style of sentences and so forth. This was, of course, this was literary analysis that they were doing, in effect, in the terms of identifying who wrote um, each piece. So later, when I met Larry, more about Larry later. Are you here, Larry? There he is. Okay. Is Larry, will you just stand up for one second? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Larry and I started talking about when we met, after having been seven years in the same building without meeting, we started talking about what it would be like to have kids working out in this industry and writing about their experience. Having an, a, a humanities class where the text of the humanities course was their experience in the workplace. And they would access it by writing and then share that writing, articulate it and share it by writing. So uh, we thought about that and we were talking about it. And then Larry became director, having been a carpentry teacher, was now director of uh, OCED, Occupational Ed in Cambridge. And shortly after he became director, he got a call from Polaroid Corporation, Cambridge, which then had 13 buildings in Cambridge. And Polaroid said to him, we'd like to do co-op with your students. Because in their building and maintenance shops, electrical, plumbing, carpentry, et cetera, they were white, male, and middle-aged. And they wanted to diversify, and they knew that we could help them. And Larry said to them, yeah, we'd love to work with you, but we're not going to do co-op. And they said, what do you mean? Larry said, well, we're going to do internships. I'll send a teacher over there to work with the kids. They work in the shops, but over lunchtime, the teacher will work with the kids hour and a half in humanities. And they said, OK. And Larry hung up the phone, called me, said, we're in, because that's what we've been talking about. For me, that was the beginning of high-tech high. That was 1991. We opened in 2000, but that was the beginning of high-tech high. Uh, because of our, with our opportunity to see what would happen if we had kids working out and where the text was their experience. Um, and that became, it was a life-changing experience for those kids. And we knew that if we ever had a chance to start a school, we would build it around internships. And we knew one other thing, too. If we ever had a chance to start a school, we knew that we would have to have a robust learning environment for the teachers, for the adults. And so that we would build a schedule, even before we were going to have internships, that would accommodate internships. And we would build a schedule where teachers come to school an hour a day before the kids. That raises the question, what are you going to do with that time? But we had the time. And then we could play with what to do with it. So then people would come and they say, wow, you've got these great design principles. I'm going to have to check the time here. Oh, man. OK, got to move. OK, here we go. S stay with me on this. Um, people said, we have these great design principles, personalization, adult world connection, uh, common intellectual mission. Two of those, by the way, were directly borrowed from the Coalition of Essential Schools. And then one of them was the School of Work Movement, Adult World Connection. And people would come to us and say, wow, great, great design principles. This is really fabulous. Love to see, love what's going on here. Could we have a copy of your curriculum? And we'd say, no, well, we don't have a curriculum. And we fumbled around for a little bit. We felt, felt a little embarrassed that we didn't have a curriculum. Uh, but then we realized that we had to 
resuscitate a fourth design principle that was there, but we had never stated it because four design principles is too many, right? It needs to stay simple. Charles Mingus, we were playing Mingus when you came in. Charles Mingus, the great American jazz bassist and composer, said, anybody can make the simple complicated. Creativity lies in making the complicated simple. So we had simple design principles then, but, but we had to then let people know, no, we don't have a curriculum. Teacher, the teachers design the curriculum. This is about teacher as designer. That's our fourth uh, principle. So I want to talk to you a little bit about one, one instance of this. Uh, Ali, is Ali here? Anyway, Ali Wong, is she here? No. OK, so Bobby Shaddix and Ali Wong, they, they come into their classroom, their sixth grade classroom, and they ask their kids, up on the wall is, with the kids is, what are your questions about the world and yourself? And the kids, and they have post-its, the kids start writing all their questions. This is the first day that they come in. The kids write their questions, they put them up, the kids start to organize them under categories and themes and so forth. They build their whole curriculum for that semester, for that three months, around the kids' questions. Do I have some questions here? Yeah, here's some of the questions that they asked. So um, the questions are about, you know, well, you can see them. You can see them. But at the same time, and, they, and so they built this thing, they built this curriculum around because they realize that all their questions, one way or another, are about uh, the ways in which the world might end and things that we might do about it. But meanwhile, so they had this wonderful, they do this both a wonderful exhibition, but meanwhile, Bobby and Allie are asking this question, what happens when we co-design a uh, curriculum with students? And the, and the outcome was this wonderful ex exhibition in this book. So what we're talking, what we're talking about here is uh, co-design. Uh, and we're talking about building uh, uh, text out of, uh, building curriculum out of experience. So just to go on. Oh, and, and then other teachers are asking uh, these kinds of questions. A lot of the questions about equity, uh, but asking about the, so our aspiration, and I think we're getting there, is to have our school as an equitable community of inquiry. All of the questions that you saw in the beginning that we've been asking here, these are questions that belong inside schools and the people who should be pursuing them are teachers and students together. It's not, these are not questions for some policy maker somewhere to make a decision about and bring to us. These are questions that belong inside. So we need to liberate uh, the time and the space and the wherewithal to be community, equitable communities of learning, learner, learning ourselves. Uh, so I'm going to run. I asked uh, Tony to send me the competencies from his slide the other day. And there they are. You've seen them. And his wonderful pathways to the competencies. OK? Inventory, purpose, understand. These are all things that really matter. But I want to propose something else. These are all things about what the students will be able to do or what will happen for the students. But I'm thinking about the teachers. So I want to propose three operational principles for equitable teaching and learning. Are you ready? Here we go. Experiences text. I've been talking about that. Collegial pedagogy, meaning this is Frary. And it's us when we're at our best, that teachers and students pursue together questions to which they do not know the answer yet. And then finally, assessment is dialogue. So I'm going to have to skip over some things. But if we're going to talk about experience as text, we're talking about Lewis, and we're talking about Carly, and we're talking about David T.C. Ellis, creating text. Uh, and moving and powerful text, and text that we can then interrogate out of their experience. 
We're talking about Freire and the mediating object and the Skywalk video. But here's a question. What is it that gives a child standing in a classroom? If we honor experience as text, every child has standing. We have plenty of external text that we can bring in. But external texts divide classrooms into kids who are uh, conversant and kids who are not. If we honor experience as the text and use that as a platform to enter into other texts, then every child has standing. What about the content? Okay, so here's the story. I'm going on a little bit. Are you okay with this? I'll go on a little bit. Here's the story. Stephanie Lytle, a te teacher at uh, High Tech High International, comes, she comes to San Diego, she realizes there are a lot of homeless people in the streets. And then she realizes a lot of them are veterans. And so she goes to the veterans home or veterans center in San Diego. She proposes a project. She says, I'm going to have my kids come and interview veterans, your veterans, and they're going to create poems out of the words of your veterans, and they're going to create pieces of art to express the experience that's expressed in those poems. So they did that. And the veterans came for an event here where the kids read the poems and then presented those poems to the veterans and the artwork. And the veterans said things like, the first time anybody ever really listened to me about my experience. And the kids said, I had to make this good because it was real and I didn't want to let my, my partner down. But you th just think... You got a CD from Carly and Lewis the other day. It was a gift. Uh, the product of this process was a gift. But meanwhile, they're reading Beowulf. And they're reading about the scope of the bard who sings the praises of the returning warrior and who is a healer. They're not only reading about that, they are enacting that role. They are acting as healers. That's what's happening at HSRA also. In that work, there's a lot of healing that's going on. Um, and when we treat experience as text, oh, but Carly did it too. Carly goes out and investigates and what's, what's white supremacy? And then she brings that back in. Um, this going out and getting information and getting data uh, out of the community and so forth. I, gotta, I, gotta, I know I gotta move. So let's honor experience as text. Collegial pedagogy, I just, all I wanna say is you see it at HSRA, you see it in the Bay Area with uh, the, the uh, youth radio project where kids go out and do radio stuff scripts and then sell them to NPR. That's out of school youth that are doing that. Um, but what's happening in those, when we do collegial pedagogy, we flip the authority relationships between teachers and students. There are many, many bases for authority in the classroom. Listen up. Listen to me because I'm older than you are. I've studied this subject. I'm getting paid to do this. So listen. So those are all there. They're all present in the situation, but they are not the authentic basis for authority. The authentic basis for authority is we have a common purpose. I am the custodian of that purpose. But you are too. It's a shared authority. A shared authority around shared purpose. That's what collegial pedagogy is about. And you can't do it without changing the paradigm, without shifting the paradigm. You take our design principle of personalization. Yeah, we can do that, and everything else stays the same. You take a connection with the world. Yeah, we can do that, everything else stays the same. You cannot do, you cannot honor experience as text, or do collegial pedagogy, or conduct assessment as dialogue without shifting the paradigm. So to the question of what can I do, it doesn't matter where you are. There is some paradigm shifting 
that you can do in your classroom, in the relationship between you and your kids. There's something you can do now. It's not enough big picture, but it's something that will make a difference in the lives of your kids and in your lives now. That's what I think, anyway. I think that Far uh, Camille Farrington's mindsets offer a reasonable and viable basis for assessment. Because, particularly the first one there and the last one, here's the point. It does not make sense to assess student performance absent assessment of the context in which that performance occurred. So, mindset number one, I belong in this community of learners. Well, yeah, and you've performed something, but we need to look at that performance and whether or not you felt you were in a community of learners and how successful the teacher was in generating that community of learners or the school. Integrated assessment, that's what Performance assessment needs to be integrated and it needs to be dialogued. So here's a question for you all. You've just had a couple of days of learning here. You know, you've been here, you've been doing deep dives and going to the deep dive den and workshops and so on. And you've been doing a lot of conversation outside in the hallways and how would you like to be assessed? How would you like to be assessed on this learning experience? I could tell you, you know, you went to this workshop in pursuing triviality, and I think maybe you get a B for that. You say, what are you talking about? A B? That was an awful exper experience. It wasn't worth anything. But we would need to talk about that. Our assessment has to be, and you're doing it yourselves anyway, has to be dialogical and integrated, okay? Enough about that. So in a conclusion, this is what I was going to say. All right, This is what I was going to say. But um, I've talked with my good friends Davo and Summa from Australia, and um, they've got a better language for it. And their language is, move fast, make noise, and break things. Okay? It's what we need to do. I want to end with a couple of things. And I, I'm not going to apologize for going over because that's just jive. Oh, man. I, you know, I have to tell you my parable. I have to tell you my Kafka. Kafka. Before the law. A guy comes before the law. And there's a gate and a gatekeeper. And the gate is open, but the gatekeeper is there. And the guy says, I want to enter the law. And, and, the, and the gatekeeper says, no, not yet. But he can peek in and see. And the gatekeeper says, oh, yeah, I see we're doing that. You can go in if you want to, but, you know, there's another gatekeeper, and then another one after that, and then another one after that. And each one is more powerful than one before. I can't even bear myself to glance, even glance, at the third gatekeeper. But he gives him a chair. He says, you can, here, take this chair. You can sit by the gate. So he sits by the gate. He comes back periodically. Not yet. Not yet, not yet. Days pass, weeks pass, months pass, years pass, and he's still sitting by the gate, thinking that it is better to wait for permission than to enter on his own. Finally, he's about, he's reaching his dying day, and he has this revelation, and he is, his body is going stiff and his eyes dim, and he calls the gatekeeper over, and the gatekeeper comes and he says, everyone strives to be before the law. Why is it that in all these years, I'm the only one who has come to this gate? And the gatekeeper says, this gate was assigned to you and you alone. I'm going to close it now. That's the end of the parable. I mean, it's Kafka, so what do you expect? I mean, it's pretty dark. <laughs> but we all have our gates. We might think about that a little bit. I mean, what's the gate that's, that I'm sitting by? I'm, I, and I just want to say, the reason I asked Larry to stand earlier is that to me it's been a blessing, and I think to all of us at High Tech High, that we have worked with someone who was not content 
to sit by the gate. Um, and who was ready to go through or ready to get another way around. Um, and there are gates, and there are series and series and series of gates, and David T.C. Ellis has talked about them. Uh, but there's something about this parable. And the thing about the parable is that the supplicant is alone. We are not alone. Right? And there's another thing about this parable. We identify with the supplicant. But the parable speaks to another side of us. We are gatekeepers also. So what do we, the what is to be done for us is not just about how am I going to get through the gate, but it's also what am I going to do about my role as the gatekeeper? Um, so, you know, something to think about. I'm going to end. A group of Israelis came to Haitekai, and they were from a, a, a region, a, a section of Tel Aviv. The mayor was there with them. We thought we were going to run stuff and show them. The mayor ran every meeting. Ben Daly was in uh, one of the meetings. Ben was about to present something about his work and so on. And the mayor said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want you to tell me in one sentence what you want kids to get out of High Tech High. And Ben looked at him and very quickly said, I want them to be passionate about something. So there were some kids there, some alumni, who were there to participate in presentations of learning, to panelists. And they came, and we invited them to lunch. They came to sit for lunch, three or four of them. And the mayor turns to one of the kids and says, I want you to tell me in one sentence what you got out of High Tech High. And the kid turns to him and says, I can tell you in one word, passion. I mean, it's a stunning uh, affirmation uh, from the world of what we're about, and, and, a, and, a, and a stunning summation from both of them uh, about what's fundamental um, to, to high tech eye and to teaching and learning. Howard Fuller, one of our heroes, says this, high expectations are crucial, but to reach our children, deeper feeling must be present. It's called love. I believe with all my heart and soul that we cannot teach our children if we do not love them, believe in them, and respect the families and communities they represent. In her book, Return to Love, author Marianne Williamson commented on the fairy tale, The Frog Prince. This is Marianne Williamson. The fairy tale reveals the deep psychological connections between our attitudes toward people and their capacity for transformation. In the story, a princess kisses a frog, and he becomes a prince. What this signifies is the miraculous power of love to create a context in which people naturally blossom to their highest potential. Until we love them, we cannot understand them. And Harold, um, Harold Fu Howard Fuller continues, if we do not love our children, we cannot understand them. If we do not understand them, we cannot reach them. If we cannot reach them, we cannot teach them. So what is the nature of this love? I get emails every day from uh, Galen Gingrich of the All Souls Unitarian Church in New York City. And today, this one just dropped out of the sky on me. And this is Isabel Carter Hayward on, on love. She says, love, like truth and beauty, is concrete. Love is not fundamentally a sweet feeling, not at heart a matter of sentiment, attachment, or being drawn toward. Love is active, effective, a matter of making reciprocal and mutually beneficial relation with one's friends and enemies. Love creates righteousness or justice or here on earth. For this reason, love, loving involves commitment. We are not automatic lovers of self, others, world, or God. Uh, we, we're not love machines. 
puppets on a string of a deity called love. Love is a choice, not simply or necessarily a rational choice, but rather a willing, willingness to be present to others without pretense or guile. Love is a conversion to humanity. I am human. Black Lives Matter. A willingness to, persist, to participate with others in the healing of a broken world and broken lives. We can do this. And I just, I will end. I, it's, I want to go back, I say one thing, that is, move fast, make noise and break things, but also there's a proverb in Swahili. Kutumbeya pekini vibaya. It is bad to walk alone. Come, let us walk together. Thank you. We're just about out of time, and I know Rob, I know many of you have questions, but he's also, because he is Rob, his response to me was, do you want to do questions? And he's like, I'm in service of them. And so his, his ethos was not what I need, but what this audience needs right now. So if you want to ask him some questions, let me know. I want to thank him and all of us. Um, we are just out of time, um, and now I'm crying, and I was trying to be joyful and exciting, now I'm crying. Um, <laughs> but I want to thank the many, many people that are on this stage, our friends from Hewlett, the Walton Family Foundation, the High Tech High Graduate School of Education that we're in, um, the HS, HSRA, amazing friends and fellows, our good friends, Tony and TC and Carly and Lewis, Dario and the many people, the CDs they produce, Talib, who just shows up out of nowhere, thanks to Tony, um, Sound Image, who made this amazing sound stuff happen. I have no idea how it works, but they made it happen. Um, and lastly, I want to take a moment to just thank the entire DL Dream Team, as we like to call ourselves, Ben, Cheyenne, Randy, Haley, Larry, who's running around, um, Carmen, Law, um, our wonderful video club, Gabe and his many crew, Bonnie who's been tweeting and getting all of our ideas out on getting smart, um, and our facilities crew, our catering staff, our IT staff, and lastly, of course, all of our students who have made this event really possible, and probably most importantly, all of you for showing up. When you put on a conference, it's like you're having a party. You're not sure if everyone's going to come and if the food's going to be good. Um, and really what we were hoping for, many of us here at High Tech High, High Tech High is like a second home to us. We spend a lot of time here, um, and we love it here, and we hope, and I hope, that you felt welcomed and you felt loved and that you have found a home here as well. So thank you all so, so much. If I missed anybody my thank yous, I am so sorry, um, but I want to bring on, because they are amazing, our final slide, our equity fellows, of course, and thanking them, but last and certainly not least, um, the awesome DL Band to close you out today. Come on stage, my DL Band folks. And as they're coming on stage, find your shakers, send a note to yourself, share out on Deeper Learning, and then have a great day. Okay, we get to go out loud and proud. One last chance. Get vocal. You can stand if you want to shake those legs out a little bit. All right. We want to thank the beautiful murals, too. The murals were beautiful. Didn't want to miss anybody on that. Okay, let's get equitable. Here we go. You completed a 
are successful people learn in confidence. It's time for action steps and things to do. The Deeper Learning Band recommends reflection. Time to think about how this experience affected you. What you did was put your heads together around the most important thing. Perhaps nothing bigger in education than to consider the ramifications of equity, such as protocols, student choice, diverse group, exhibition, Maybe it was Robert Jordan or Tony Simmons. Or maybe you should just give yourselves a hand. Your site might host the next great conference. Give us a call if you need a band. And we'll sing about scaffolding. Critique and revise. Equity. Differentiate. Equity. Everyone. Deeper learning. Equity. Well, I guess we don't have a big sax solo. We're going to have to rely on you all. We're going to give you things that should be equitable. And folks, you can give us the equity call. Here we go. Code of call. Student choice. Diverse group. And deeper learning. Equity. Have a great time in the rest of your stay in San Diego. Those of you staying with us, we're so glad you're still here. We'll see you next year.